Hello, it's Melissa Sweet here, Public Health Journalist from Croaky. I'm talking here with Dr. Leonie Cox, we're at the Catsman, the Congress of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Nurses and Midwives Conference on the Gold Coast. And Leonie was involved yesterday in a workshop on cultural safety, in which she showed a very powerful slide, what basically saying white fellows need to step up. Can you explain a bit about that, Leonie? Sure, uh, thanks Melissa. Um, well, being a white fella, I wanted to try and explain why it was that I was even talking in this space um, and in these, uh, this field because a lot of white fellas feel very nervous about doing so. Um, often because of the stuff Chris Sara was talking about this morning, interestingly, about uh, you know trying to be culturally sensitive and that then can lead to this whole lot of actions that actually amount to white fellas not shouldering their responsibility to uh, take a part in what I call the Australian problem. Yeah, so often we think we have, you know, there's talk about having an Aboriginal problem when we think of the health statistics and so forth. However, um, what cultural safety would say is that a lot of that is uh, related to history and racism. And both of those are white fella issues and a power imbalance and that kind of stuff. So how can white fellas step up? I think firstly by educating themselves about history. Um, I find that a lot of our undergraduate students, and we have around 600 or 700 first year students starting, most of whom are uh, non-Aboriginal and mainstream Australian, um, they get very surprised, many of them, when they hear about the history. Um, they get angry and they get guilty because they say, well, why didn't anyone tell me? Why wasn't I told? And so we have to then say, well, look, you're an adult now, so it's your responsibility to educate yourself more. We have to get away from this idea that at universities we can give people all of the content that they might ever need. So I think the first thing is for white fellas to take an interest and to educate themselves about history, about racism and its impacts, about how power works and that kind of stuff. And in relation to tackling racism, what is our responsibility? I think um, recognising that it's not just about the personal behaviour of a few immoral people, that it's a whole systematised and institutionalised regime, a social construction that started with the great chain of being and um, has sort of become common sense in, in mainstream society. Um, I mean, as I was saying yesterday, even uh, my beloved ABC uses the term race as if it's a self-evident kind of biological fact when in fact there is no biological basis to race, as uh, again has been heard elsewhere in the conference, um, you know, we're all humans. We all have um, probably more things that unite us and that we have in common than we have as differences. And yet a whole lot of cultural approaches often want to focus on these exoticized sort of ideas of culture. And it's just not particularly helpful, particularly not in clinical areas where we need to fulfil people's needs. And you mentioned the plethora of terms used around cultural awareness, cultural sensitivity, etc, etc, and that they're not interchangeable. Can you sort of distinguish some of the key terms that are used and why it matters that we're clear about what we're talking about? Sure. Um, this morning even a new one was added called cultural comfort or cultural, being culturally comfortable. It matters because we need to be clear what we're talking about. If we're going to develop ways forward and policy and practice that actually will make a difference, we need to look at what's been happening in the past and what might need to change. So uh, to her credit, Madeleine Leninger came up with what's called transcultural nursing. And um, so she was one of the first people to recognize actually that culture and health and society and health have something to do with one another. So that was great work. However, sadly, it didn't really look at the power dynamics involved, and it tended to take a transcultural approach, which is where um, we always focus on white fellas gaining cultural awareness about other people's culture. So that's a very dominating position. It also assumes an idea of culture as unchanging, like this idea that I could sort of look at somebody's culture, say Aboriginal, Taiwanese, Chinese, whatever, and learn it and then that would help me work out how to work with someone in a nursing context. I just think that's not very helpful. Um, and so we have to be clear that cultural awareness, which we often hear about, is part of a kind of a older model which was based on cultural awareness training um, and it always positioned white people in a position of normal, 
and so-called diverse people in a position of being different that we had to learn about. So cultural safety is a fully theorised model, it's not just a set of words that could easily be able to change with some other words. So it's really important that when people use the term cultural safety, they actually understand what it means. And I'd suggest to do that, to go back and read the work of Ira Happity Ramsden, 2002, who worked with her colleagues in New Zealand to actually develop this model based on emancipatory theory, critical theory, feminist theory, um, and very much to address uh, what we end up with in a post-colonial situation, or as she would say, a neo-colonial situation, because actual colonisation colonization hasn't actually ended. So it's a very important uh, model. So it sort of demeans it and disrespects it if people just think that the terms like cultural humility or cultural sensitivity or all of these other words are just the same thing when they're not. And the other problem is cultural competence. Now, we kind of get stuck with this a little bit because our regulatory authorities tend to use this term in nursing particularly because it's a competency-based profession. But the idea that you can be competent in someone else's culture is, I think, immediately problematic in a clinical area. What we do need to be confident in, if anything, is educating ourselves about the history of this country and how that history continues to be played out and how it impacts on health. Um, other than that, uh, our competency needs to revolve around our own cultural self-awareness, our own cultural position. So if we have to use that word competence or cultural competence, that's what it should refer to and then that would be in keeping with cultural safety. How well do you think we do in integrating true cultural safety in the health system from education, training, practice, policy? Where are we at? Oh, I think we're in a very muddled state. Um, not all universities um, teach cultural safety, some are still having a transcultural approach. But I think we're in a, a great moment of transition where our regulatory authorities, probably in no small part um, thanks to some of the work of Pat Sinam, have uh, begun to use and understand the term cultural safety um, and, you know, and the fact of what it might imply. However, we do like research, as people have been pointing out, there's not a lot of research to um, you know, show whether or not someone with cultural safety education actually ends up being a culturally safe practitioner according to consumers. Um, so there's some problems there. Um, however, I think given that it embraces a politicised understanding of health, uh, a critical approach to race, an understanding of social constructionism, I think it has to be a better way forward than um, putting whites in a position of dominance and saying everything else that deviates from that is somehow, you know, exotic. So I think we have a ways to go, um, but I do see a moment of change at, at the moment. What are some specific next steps that you'd like to see? Um, I'd like to see it throughout the codes of um, conduct, uh, ethics, um, I'd like to see it much more integrated in um, clinical nurse education and I think it sort of has to be like a diffusion model like we often talk about up down or I mean yeah from the bottom up or top down I'd like to see cultural safety and I think this is beginning to happen beginning to be modeled and taught in every every sphere so that um, when our students go out who have cultural safety education uh, they begin to meet people in clinical areas who now know what that's about and understand how to make it happen. So there's things like services taking responsibility to understand that not only individuals have cultures but so do services and health systems. And you've spoke about nursing and midwifery education in particular, but what about the wider health uh, professions and systems? How you know, is this something that could be done across the board in health and medical curricula? Well, I think uh, there's a number of models that work together with cultural safety, and one of them is person-centred care. Now, this has a big international movement, so I think cultural safety could be very well piggybacked on that movement to actually change cultures, because that's what we have to change for person-centred care. And, of course, cultural safety is a fantastic model to bring about person-centred care, because that's what it focuses on in, is the person in front of us not some stereotype of some culture that we have in our mind and it also asks us to be accountable for our own behavior and assumptions so um, I think cultural change um, you know we hear of whole services undergoing transformation and 
you know, I've seen in my own institution, we've had a transformed bachelor's degree. So I think, um, you know, all steps towards this could be made, but we, it, it is a big talk, and I think we just have to take incremental We're talking change. about clinical systems mainly, but often it's the wider systems that affect population health. Mm. What, what difference do you think it might make if we had cultural safety training for politicians? I think it would make a huge difference because they would realise that health isn't brought about by health services. Health is brought about by social systems that are equitable, by housing, employment, um, addressing things in the Indigenous space like over-incarceration and police harassment and all of those kinds of social determinants of health. So sadly, <clears throat> I don't think there's a very good appreciation of the social determinants of health amongst politicians and this idea that if we just chuck more and more money at tertiary health services like hospitals that we're going to somehow solve Indigenous or indeed any other form of health issue. So I think there's a big problem with so that. So would you go so far as calling for cultural safety training for politicians? I would. <laughs> I haven't thought of that before, but I would. <laughs> Something I've been trying to promote um, in my own context is training in cultural safety for the most senior academics and managers at the university because until people at that level understand what it is we're trying to do, and that it isn't just a new buzzword for this, you know, business as usual, then we're not we're not gonna get proper buy-in. So that's something that myself and colleagues are working on in our context. So yes, I think that would be very helpful across the board. Great. Well thank you very much for your time. It's been great talking to you. Thanks.